You call these the four okay. stages of parenting. So I'm just going to throw the, them out and I just want you to, you know, just tell me what that means and then we'll just go to the next one, okay? Okay. All right, so the first one is this. Discipline stage, ages 1 to 5. Yeah, I mean, we just had our grandkids with us for uh the week and they are 6 4 3 2 1 and a three month old. So we have six grandkids now. So they're in the discipline stage. And all I can tell you is exhausting. Yep. You never get to sleep. You're always trying to, you know, set boundaries and enforce the boundaries and teach them. So, uh, but you know, as we say in the book, it's a really critical, critical time. I don't know if you read this in the book, but one time Ann and I were teaching at our church about parenting. And she turns to me because often when we teach together, we don't know what the other one's going to do. We don't yeah. try to script it. And she literally turns to me. I didn't know she was going to ask this. And she goes, what do you remember about the discipline stage? You know, zero to five. And I, I thought to myself, I wanted to say, I remember thinking I'll never take another nap the rest of my life because you never get a break. Right. But what came out of my mouth was I'll never take another crap yep. the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, I that did read that. That was awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, we're <laughs> flying down to California with our uh, granddaughter this weekend. My wife's a flight attendant. So we're going to fly down. She's four years old, the granddaughter. And so I just, I'm like, uh, how do I, how did I do it? I was just tired the whole time. I remember telling my wife, if <laughs> I will paint the cabinets, if you just let me take a nap, you know, that type of thing. So, well, and you wrote in your book, you said, yeah. quote, kids at this tender age don't have a concept of how to obey appropriately which is a key to developing maturity in their attitudes and viewpoints down the road, which I thought was so powerful and, and so good for us to realize there is this phase from one to five that is a discipline phase, but that moves into and transitions into phase two. And phase two, I want you to explain, is from five to 12. And this is called in your book, the training stage. Yeah, and it really came in, in in our mind from Ephesians 6, 4, which says, you know, fathers, don't exasperate your children, but bring them up in the training. There's the word, yep. training and instruction of the Lord. And so, you know, we've discovered now that we're grandparents and we have three grown sons and they're married, we discovered that the first 12 years, the discipline stage and then the training stage are critical. I mean, they're really like we we already said, they're exhausting you're tired a lot, but man, you're laying a foundation spiritually, but also again, and it's, it's hard work and it, and you just want to give up at times, but trying to set boundaries, this is what no means. And I'm going to enforce that boundary. Cause I, I think in some ways we are training them to understand how God works as well. God loves you. God has a plan for our life, but he has boundaries as well, and he enforces them. And the reason the boundary is there, we know as parents, is we're protecting our child. They may not understand that, but we do. And it's the same thing God's doing for us. It sounds crazy sometimes when we read some of God's boundaries, but when we look back, we're like, oh my goodness, God was literally trying to help us live our best life. He wants us to thrive. We don't understand this, but to thrive, we have to stay within this boundary. So in some ways, we are training our kids not only to obey us, but to someday as they become adults, obey God. Well, and in your book, you talk about boundaries uh, seem counterintuitive. And so you wrote mm. that boundaries are liberating, not confining. Choosing their own boundaries in a big and dangerous world outside that fence may seem alluring to them, but it's too big with too many choices that are beyond their ability to make. So I thought that was a powerful quote. And I think that it's, I oh mean, that's so true that we... I had a guy just today, a pastor, uh, responded to one of my social media posts, and he says, I don't like what you said about going to church and serving in ministry because that sounds like a rule to me. And I said, well, that sounds like being devout and holy to me, and we're trying to raise kids who are healthy and strong. And I think it's important that your book brought out this point that boundaries are part of that. Yeah, I don't think uh, I understood it initially. Because you feel like when you put, you know, we refer to in the book, uh, the boundary is a fence. When you put up a fence, it feels limiting. It feels like, yeah. oh, now I can't be free. And yet when a person knows where the boundary is, where the fence is, and that it's not going to move, because, you know, the temptation as a parent is when we get tired, we're like, okay, I said we're going to bed at eight, but who cares? Let's go to bed. At you know, and you move the fence. But what you discover is when you know where the fence is and you know it's stable and it's not moving, you actually feel free. You're like, okay, 
there's the fence. Anything inside here, I'm, I'm wild. I can do whatever I want inside this fence. And so we think we're limiting our children, but if we really do set the boundary well and they understand it, I think they feel a sense of freedom. I even interviewed some teenagers when we were teaching on this years ago in our church. And I was shocked to hear these teenagers say, yeah, my parents let me do anything I want and I feel like they don't love me. I'm like, what? Wow. Every teenager wants to be able to do whatever they want. And they're like, yeah, it's not really how it works out. I feel like if they love me, they'd set some boundaries for me and I would know, uh, you know, what I'm allowed to do and what I'm not supposed to do, but they just let me do anything. So I, I feel, I feel very unloved. That's like, wow, that's a, that's an interesting perspective. Hey guys, that's worth the price of admission right there. If you are mm -hmm. soft on boundaries, you are yeah. hurting and hating your children. So you're referring, I think Anne must have, you know, there's a certain tone that you guys write with. Did she write <laughs> with the, did she write the fence section or did you? Uh, I wrote most of that. Yeah. Okay. So you wrote, a but I, I wrote like, whatever, I wrote whatever she told me to write. So, you know, that's what that was. <laughs> oh, Hey, it's like the guy who says I wear the pants in the family. My wife just tells me which one. So, you know, yeah. that, so, well, you wrote this and I think this is really good. You said, once you set a boundary and they bump up against it, enforce the boundary immediately. I, that's so powerful. And then you continued, you said, this is on page 91. If you move the boundary, they win. And in this case, it means they lose down the road because they won't have the boundaries for obedience that lead to so many other important things in life. I hate to keep quoting your book back to you, but that's so powerful that this, that, that this, can you speak to this immediacy of enforcing the boundary? Yeah, it was something that, that we learned. And again, as the title of the book tells you, we're not perfect at this. We don't try to say we did this perfectly. But one of the things that we learned was that when you move the boundary, and again, it's easy to do. You're tired. They're pushing up against it. And you're like, okay, what's, what's the big deal? I'm just going to say this time it's okay. You are training them to train you. You know, you don't realize that you like the, yep. the old thing. Hey, when I count to 10, I'm going to count to 10. And then we're, you have just, you've basically trained them like, okay, it doesn't mean anything until he gets to nine, you know, but when yep. you try, and again, it's hard to do, but when you try to say, Hey, first time obedience, when I say it, I mean it, let's get upstairs. When I say it, let's get in the bathtub, whatever it is. I think you are training them like, wow. And you can see, man, if you watch other kids and other parents and you shouldn't walk around and judge people, but you can see the kids yep. that their parents, they just like my mom and dad, they don't mean what they say. Cause I, when they get, when they start yelling or when they start running after me, then I know I'm in trouble, but it doesn't mean anything. Cause they're not going to back it up. But man, the kids that respond immediately, you think, oh, they're great kids. I think their parents did a good job because all kids will respond that way. I'm not saying it's easy, but they'll respond if you, you know, I used to watch the show. I don't know if you guys remember the nanny. Remember the yeah, nanny yeah, on oh, TV? Yeah. And oh, she yeah. would come into this house that was just chaos. <laughs> and she would say, I'll have these kids behaving in three days. And you're like, there's no way. And in three days, it was a whole different house. And it's because she set the fence. She enforced the fence. The kids pushed on it like crazy, hated her for the first day. And then they realized, wow, she means business and it works. No, that's, that's really powerful. Really good. You know, I was thinking when, when you said that, I thought, well, I was only the guy that went to three, but it was <laughs> two and a, two and a quarter, two and an eight, yeah. two and a quarter, yeah. two and a half. Well, it ended up being 10. And so that yeah. was a mistake that we made because we were, we did preach first time obedience, but sometimes in our weariness and after about the hundredth, why we started doing the three countdown that ended up being about 12. So, so that's the yeah. training stage. I think building a fence is so important. That was just a very powerful part of the book and then move into phase three. Now for me as a parent, and I know you as well, probably as a football guy with sons, the coaching stage, I really did well in this stage. It was easier mm -hmm. for me than the previous two stages. Can you explain this 12 to 18 coaching stage and some of the things you learned? Well, for Ann and I, it was our favorite stage. And you know, what's interesting is so many parents were telling us, oh, wait till they become teenagers. You're just going to hate it. They're going to rebel and blah, blah, blah. And I tell you what, we look back and I'm not saying they didn't make mistakes and we, we share them in the book and they wrote, you know, in the book. 
uh, yeah, there was some rebellion going on, but man, oh man, it was in our, in our, in our experience, the best, the best stage. Cause they're becoming men, or if you have daughters, they're becoming women. Uh, they pull away and we write about this in the book. It's really easy as they pull away to think, oh, they don't want me in their life. And we try to say in the book, no, they really do want you. They may not say it. They may not act like it but they long to have a relationship with dad. They long to have a relationship with mom. And so it's a chance to pursue them in an appropriate way to stay connected in their life. But now they're making adult decisions. You know, you, when, you, when you're a younger parent, and you have little kids, you're thinking, oh man, these are big decisions they're making at five and six and eight years old. And then you realize that's nothing. Now they're making real decisions about what they're going to do with their sexuality and their body and the friends they're going to choose and the decisions they're going to make about alcohol and different things and about their relationship with God. It's the stage where they look at everything you poured into them spiritually and they start to say, okay, do I believe this? And that's scary for a parent because they may, you know, take it and go, I don't think I believe this. And for us as parents, we usually then try to shove it down their throat. It's the worst thing you can do because it pushes them the way you got to let them find their own faith. But that's, that's a freedom that often we don't want to give our kids, but it's really, you're becoming, you're become you're coming alongside them as their coach now, not as much the dictator that, that you have to do a little bit in the earlier years. So Dave, I graduate, you're a little bit older than me. I graduated high school in 1984 and played college football as well. And when we were playing college ball, it was all about the bench squats, cleans, right? But nowadays they have these things called workout bands. Have you seen these big rubber bands? Yeah. Yep. I, I, I don't even understand them, but you know, I think they're a great <laughs> parenting illustration. When I read your book, I thought about these rubber bands. So we throw, and this is from your book. I, I thought we throw a rubber band over our kids and their teenagers. And as they begin to distance themselves, we allow that. But then we get to a certain point and we re-engage and, and get yeah. closer. And there's a, there's a problem with parents that say, I'm going to detach during this phase because my kid doesn't want me. And you did a great job in the book of saying, no, that's not true. Let them, let them disengage, but stay close enough to be there. And, uh, that, yeah, that was, so that was a fun phase for us as well. I would say that my most enjoyable phase is probably right now. I think my mm. kids are 23, 25 and 27, three sons. And this is stage four. This is 18 plus. Can you walk us through that stage and how it's different than the coaching stage? Yeah, we we love this stage as well. Uh, like I said, we just did a little lake uh, vacation at the lake. And I, and I love it that I have buddies that have a house on the lake that we can borrow. <laughs> so, you know, we were there with our three sons, their wives, and six grandkids. And we call it the friendship stage because it's in some ways you're hoping that you've done a good enough job in the first three stages that they want to come home, that they want to hang with mom and dad, that they're excited to spend some time with dad. And so it is really a friendship stage where now it's adult to adult and no longer are we telling them how to live. In fact, Ann and I have realized we don't tell them anything unless they ask. If they don't ask, we don't tell. I mean, not too long ago, uh, one of our sons had a newborn baby, our youngest, actually. Cody had a newborn baby, and Ann was all excited because they were going to give him his first bath. And she's like, you know, I'm going to go over and help him and show him how to do it. And so Ann's like, hey, you want me to come overnight and help you do the bath? They go, no, we just YouTubed it. We're good. And we're like, <laughs> you YouTubed it? You got mom and dad right here. Like, yeah, you know, they think YouTube's going to teach them something better than what we do. But again, that's that stage where, you know, we don't you know, override their life. We sort of are friends. And when they ask advice, we give it. If they don't ask advice and trust me, you know, right. You're watching their lives. You're like, I have all kinds of advice you should be asking me for, but if they don't ask, we don't give it. But I tell you what, it has been a joy to have a dad to son, adult man to adult man relationship now with my three sons. I'm not saying it's perfect at all, uh, in fact, this is the stage where they also come back and say, Hey, there's some things you did that hurt me. You know, there's some things that I wish you would have, or wouldn't have done. We've had those conversations and those are hard, but it's awesome because, you know, they feel the freedom to say that. And I had to do the same thing with my dad when I was in my twenties, late thirties, or late twenties, early thirties. And they're experiencing the same thing with me. And the good thing about it for me is like, well, I can still get better. You know, it's not over. I can do better and I'm gonna. 
Yeah, that's so. There's so much there, Dave, that I appreciate. You know, John Elder was on our podcast a while back, and he said this is the hardest phase for him to raise his sons. Mm. And I would say, for me, that 18 to 23 college window was probably my most difficult parenting stage. But now we've moved beyond that into the sweet spot. I'm training right now to do an archery elk hunt for a week, and we're backpacking into the wilderness of Oregon with my two oldest sons. My youngest one's still playing football. Wow. And uh, it's just an honor to say, hey, Dad, will you come with us? We need, well, the, they need a collar yeah. is what they need. They can't call an elk to save their life. <laughs> but they want, But the cool thing is I get to hang out with them as peers, and now if, if we get something, they can carry the heavier load because at 55, you know how that works. But oh, you yeah. said this. And, and I want to, I want to, I want you to repeat this because I think it was worth it. And this is the hardest thing I've had to deal with. And I know for you in ministry, it must be an a credible, an incredible temptation. You said, we don't tell them anything unless they ask. Can you go back and camp on that for a little bit? I think that our guys need to hear that. Yeah, I think it's really hard. Honestly, it's really hard to not speak into their life when you see things and you know, based, you know, in, in one sense, just based on years lived mistakes made as a man, as a husband, as a dad, and then you're watching your son make the same mistakes and you just want to jump in there and go, dude, seriously, I've, I've been there. I can give you some wisdom, but if they don't want it from their dad, you can't really give it. And it's hard. And it's interesting. You know, my sons have gotten some wisdom from other men. And I look at them like, uh, I've been telling you that for like your whole life. You never heard it from me. But at the end of the day, it's like, thank God they heard it. Who yeah. cares who they heard it from? But, you know, they're going to miss it from dad. Um, you know, but even last week, you know, one of our sons did say to Ann and I said, hey, if you see anything in our parenting that, you want to make a comment about feel free and man i tell you what that was one of the first times one of our sons had said that and we didn't immediately go hey we got 15 right now we've been waiting for you to you know let us you know speak into we didn't speak into anything but the fact that he offered that was like a gift from a son to a dad it's like okay he trusts us enough to say hey if you want to, uh, you know, speak into it, you know, it, it's funny. We want to say to our sons, you know, like they're all married and two of the three have kids. You want to say, Hey, do you know what we do for a living? Do you know that, <laughs> you know, we've done over 700 podcasts with marriage yeah. and family experts, the best in the world come in our studio and tell us how to do marriage and family, right? We are like experts, you know? That's, you know, just by interviews we've done and they've never asked not one time have they asked. <laughs> and so we just wait. No, because they, they don't see you as that. They see you as mom yep. and dad. So I, I you know, there's, I wanted to say to our listeners right now, guys, this is a great book. Uh, the first part of the book is filled with phenom phenomenal tips, how to parent through these stages. But because we're so limited on the time, I'm going to get real selfish and I'm going to move into the part that impacted me the most. And so I want to talk about this. And Dave, this is where you got real. Uh, I know you're a great man. I know you're a great parent. I know you've done things right. But you get real. And and some of the things you said hurt me because I, I felt them as failures of, as a parent. And so mm -hmm. I want to unpack your top five parenting mistakes. And I know this is going to be hard. Uh, even reading it just now, it's a little emotional but I want to I want to read a quote to you. And you said okay. something in your book that I heard my wife say. And What's you said that? this. You you said one of the things I struggled with as a dad was being fully present in my home. I'd bring all my energy and focus to my job, but often when I came home, my soul was still at work. I remember stepping into the house one time after work when my five year old Austin yelled, "Mommy, Daddy's home." I know he's standing there, honey, she said, but he's actually still at the office. And uh, man, I, I related to that. My wife said to me, my mistress was my ministry. And so mm. your mistake, number one, and it's not just for pastors, but I want to unpack this for guys because we tend to default our identities uh, into our work. And so you uh, very openly and vulnerably said this, that your biggest mistake or number one was your number one out of five was I left my soul at the office. Can you embellish? Yeah. You know, I didn't realize it 
when I was doing it, obviously, but man, oh man, now looking back, I wish I would have done that differently. I, like you said, Jim, I got my identity from what I did. And I think a lot of us men do that. And so I was constantly working. I mean, Ann used to, I thought it was a joke. She used to say, yeah, my, my husband, Dave has five jobs. And now I realize it wasn't really a joke. It was, I mean, I did have five jobs. I had the family life speaking thing. We had the church. I was the Detroit Lions chaplain. And then on top of that, I coached our high school football team. And it was just, and all these things were great things. We had ministry going in all those different places. But I actually sat down with a, a, a counselor just this last year during COVID as I went through succession at our church and said, man, I want to sit down with him and talk to a guy about this. And one of the things he said to me after our first session, we did a five hour session and he sort of writes my whole life up on this whiteboard. And then after we're done, he said, okay, here's your homework assignment. I go, okay. He goes, write this question down. I want you to answer this question. I go, what's that? He goes, what are you running from? And I look at Greg and I go, what are you talking about? What do you mean? What do you mean? What, what am I running from? He goes, look at your life up here. I go, what? He goes, you had so many balls in the air. You're doing this. You're doing that. You're doing this. You did this. And then you, you, you throw in, oh yeah. And then I was a high school football coach and I was, he goes, dude, you were running from something. Answer that question. So I come home to Ann. I go, Hey, you know, Greg said, I got to answer this question. What are you running from? She looks at me like, uh, duh. You know, and it was like one of these blind spots. It's like, wow, I was running to significance. I got to be, you know, and everything I did in my life, I was the center of attention. I'm the quarterback. I'm the shortstop. I'm the point guard. I'm the guitar player, singer, you know, I'm the chaplain and the speaker on the stage. It's just, and I didn't realize it, but man, I was like running away from my home to find my identity when my family and my wife was longing for me to run home because that's who I am. Mm. I am a husband and a dad first. And I tell you, one of the things I wish I would have learned earlier, and I would say to the men that are younger than us right now, the most important disciples you will make are in your home. They're not in yes, your church true. or in your men's group. They are important men and important people. But man, oh man, if I would have looked at CJ Austin and Cody, they're the men that I need to develop as disciples. And I had a sense of that. I mean, we put that in the book, but I often found myself pouring myself into other men rather than my most important men. And I would just say to a man that's younger than us, don't make the mistake I did. Well, and in that section of the book, you unveiled another mistake within that, that I really felt because <laughs> I thought, you know what, what he's saying I've done and I'm doing. And so this, this to me was the most meaningful part of your book that I'm going to implement in fixing. Mm. And here's what you said. And, and, uh, you know, got, again, full-time ministry for, you know, 25 years before launching our ministry with men in the arena. But you said the other area, which I wasn't fully present had to do with sharing my heart with my sons. And you talk about how openly mm. you'd share your heart with your audience, but you never would you you didn't do that as well as you'd like to, and I think at one point you shared a story in the book about you and CJ, who was actually in on your staff at your church on stage, and he kind of brought that up and shocked you a little bit. I think that was the story. Was that with CJ? Yeah, that was actually Cody again. He uh, after the, oh, I've got those two confused. Yeah, CJ is my oldest. Cody is my youngest. Cody after the NFL. Uh, stint came on our staff and it was really cool. I mean, he was my co-pastor. He became, uh, he preached almost half the time and he really has a gift there. And now he's doing ministry full time as well. But yeah, on stage, you know, we have this conversation in front of the congregation. And I told him after the first service, we were doing three services that day. Uh, long story short, I just said, Hey, if there's anything you're holding back, don't hold back, man. Say whatever you want. So the next service, he says something, uh, you know, that he had sort of said to me, but said it very articulately to the congregation. And it, it was basically, you know, I often felt like dad was more intimate with the congregation than he was with us in the home. And he and, and one of my other sons had told me this sometime in that, that year, as now, again, as adult men having a conversation with them, they said, Dad, it felt like you would share things on the, on the stage at church 
that we'd never heard. And they were vulnerable and they were authentic and they were weakness. And we were sitting there looking at each other like, how in the world do we not know this? And yet the congregation is learning this about our dad. And they just said that felt like you were more intimate with them than you were with us. And as soon as they said it, the second it came out of their mouth, I knew they were right. I mean, there was nothing in me like, what are you talking about? It was like, you're right. And, and again, like I said earlier, well, I can do better. I, I am going to do better. But here's the thing that I realized as I processed that is it was easier for me as a dad to share that with a thousand people than it was to look two boys or three sons in the, in the eyes and share. It was scary. It was for me, it's like, if I'm going to go there with my sons, it takes courage. And I need to muster up the courage to go, I'm going to share something with you that's scary, but I need to say it either, whether it's about my life or maybe about our relationship or whatever. I realized it was so scary. I, it was easier to do with a bunch of people. Cause here's the thing. You're not, you're not going to talk to them later about it. They're going to go, wow, our pastor's so authentic. Isn't he amazing? And inside you're going, I only shared like 70% of it. I held back 30 cause it wouldn't be appropriate, but with my sons, Man, they they deserve to get dad's heart. And so I'm hoping that the next 20 or 30 years I get with them, they get my heart. And, you know, 10 years from now or five years from now, they go, Dad, we feel like we get all of you. We get the best of you, not other people. That's what I'm that's what my goal so Dave, is. So so Dave, do you think that that was part of your brokenness, or do you think that was part of being in that parenting phase? where you're training them and coaching them because there is an element there where, cause I, this is, I'm working on this myself, but there's an element there. Where you have to coach and train. Right. And sometimes we lose the vulnerable vulnerability in the midst of that. Or was this just part of your brokenness? I think it's a little both. I mean, there's definitely, uh, you know, as you know, as a football player, there's coaches that are two player oriented and they're like your friend. And then there's, co there's a balance there. You want to be a relationship same thing as a parent, but I think now that we're in the adult to adult man to man stage, I think it's time for me to be more, more vulnerable and be more of their friend at, at the same time. I'm still their dad, but to be able to share, uh, honestly with them. I mean, when Cody said that, when that was a gift, that really was a gift, uh, a hard gift. It's one that I wish I would have never had to hear. I wanted to hear them say, man, dad, there is nothing you did that was, you know, but it was a gift to say, you know what, we got another 10, 20, 30, whatever years, I'm going to, I'm going to do better at that, you know, and not that I don't want to give my heart to other people in ministry, but man, my heart should be given the best to my wife and to my three sons. Well, I, you said something really powerful there. I want to repeat, and I think you're right as, as my kids are now in their, their twenties to late, early to late twenties, I'm finding myself sharing more with them because we've moved into this friend mode. Yeah. And I think that is really appropriate. I think the danger would be if a father moves from discipline to training to coaching and into friend and doesn't make that transition, he creates a riff between his kids. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. what I hear you saying there. So mistake number two uh, also hurt when I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and I thought it was really interesting and the way you said it was funny, but I'm just gonna, I've got a quote from it, but I'm just going to say it, let it hang out there and let you explain it. You said mistake, mistake number two, I was nicer to the mailman than to my kids. <laughs> yeah. And I, Can you it, explain? in some ways, I think we all sort of do that. We put on a, a front for strangers and in some ways that's appropriate. I mean, you don't want to be a jerk to the guy at your front door. But I mean, you know, it's a typical, you know, you're yelling at your family and then somebody rings the doorbell or the phone rings and you just turn into this fake, you know, Hey, how you doing? It's what we do at church. You know, we put on this mask and it's just crazy. I, I've never seen it at our church many times. I want to put a sign on our front door that says, drop your mask here. You know, this is going to be a yeah. church where we don't have to wear masks. I'm not talking about COVID mask. I'm just talking about, you know, fake superficial mask, but the same thing obviously can be true at home. And so I found, and my wife said this to, this to me many times, she goes, man, you come alive outside our home. And I'm like, what do you mean? She's always man, when you walk on the stage at church or you walk into a meeting that you're leading, you just, you come alive. There's an energy. And then when you come home, you often 
don't have that energy. It's like you, you give it to other people. You don't give it to us. And there's a joy that I had outside the home that I didn't have inside my home. That that's why I wrote it as one of my mistakes. It's like, Oh, when I heard that, I was like, no, I don't, no, I don't, I don't do that. And then I'm like, yeah, I do. I did that a lot. Yeah. And you know, I want to be able to bring that joy, that energy to my home. Cause as we've already said, it's more important than anything else I'm doing. Well, and plus you're trying to raise up young men and you've got to be hard on them sometimes, especially in this world yeah. that really caters to men being soft and comfortable. And so I really appreciate yeah. that point. So Dave, mistake number three is a little bit obscure. Now from reading your book, I understand what the bullseye is. You have a letter and a certain number to describe it, but you said here, I forgot the bullseye. What does that mean? Well, at the beginning of the book, we try to uh, help parents understand, and this is something we didn't know at the beginning, but tried to learn that a key question every parent needs to ask, and hopefully you ask it when your kids are really little, is what am I trying to raise? What adult man or woman do we hope our kids will be when they're adults? And I think we often, you know, when you walk up to a parent and ask them that, which we've done many times, they look at you like, what? what? They never even thought about it. And then, so then they throw an answer like, well, we're hoping they'll be successful and happy and, you know, popular, whatever. And then you peel that back and you're like, wow, those aren't really great goals. And so we wrote in our book, the Wilson bullseye, not saying this should be your bullseye, but to show you an example of what we were shooting at, because we were trying to raise men of character, you know, men that were like Christ. And again, you can't do that perfectly. So we had our bullseye in there just as an example to say, take this example and then write your own. It's going to be unique to you, to your family and to what you uh, are going to say our priorities. And so as I think about, you know, and ours was simply train and launch L3 warriors who make a dent where they're sent. Now, here's the thing. You hear that bullseye, you're like, that makes no sense. Well, it's a Wilson bullseye. L3 was three values that our church said, if you're a disciple of Christ, you love, lock and live. In fact, we even took a song, go love, lock, live, love, lock, live. Anyway, love God and others. <laughs> That's the first one. You know, when Jesus was asked, what's the most important? Uh -huh. He said, love God and others. Lock means lock arms in community. So men realize you can't do this Christian life alone. You need men in your life and women need women and couples. And then third one was live open handedly. It's like I take my time, talent and treasures and I don't hold them for myself selfishly, but I give them away to bless the world and make a dent where your sin is. Everywhere you go, God wants to use you to make a difference, to, sh to be the kingdom extended. And so that was sort of our goal is like, man, if our three sons, when they're 25, 30, 45 years old, love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and love their neighbor as they love themselves, they are doing life in community with other men and other couples. They are taking their talents and their treasure and even their money and saying, I'm going to use it to extend the kingdom of God. That's a goal we're shooting for. And so all I was saying is, you know, at the end of the book is one of my mistakes I say, is it's easy to forget that. You know, one day we asked our kids, I think they were teenagers. We said, hey, what do you think matters to the Wilsons? What, what is a high value of the Wilson home? You know what they said? They didn't even blink. They all three looked at us football. and they go, sports. <laughs> yeah, football. <laughs> and I'm like, well, you're right. It is really important. Um, but, you know, it's like, yeah, it's so easy to lose, you know, the bullseye. And again, I'm not saying sports aren't important. Those things, they're important. But it's like, man, it's so easy. And here's the thing. Your kids don't need to know what that bullseye is, but mom and dad do, you know, because that determines everything. If you know what you're aiming at, then you work back from that and say, okay, if that's our goal, that decides what kind of school they go to, what kind of kids they hang out with, how we make decisions about this, this, this. So that's why a bullseye is really important. So all I was trying to say is it's easy to lose focus on what really matters. Well, you know, it's really interesting, Dave. So my wife and I sat down when our kids were born. We built a family vision statement. And I don't awesome. think they ever knew it was there, but it was our bullseye. Now, behind your right shoulder is the cover of your book. And it is the oh, bullseye yeah, is. with the arrows. Now, I'm an archery hunter. So I've been training, shooting five to seven days a week, training for this elk hunt that I'll never pull the arrow wow. back, the bow back, because I'm, I'm going to be calling. But the thing that this might be a good insight for you, you can, when people shoot a bow, you're aiming downrange. You don't actually look at the sight. So once you get the sight, 
set on the target. You don't look at the site anymore. You only look at the target. And what I hear you saying is, parents, mm -hmm. you have to look downrange. So it's that's not good. about the bullseye. It's about the bullseye being downrange. So that's 25 years from you. What do you want those kids to look like? And I think it was C.S. Lewis. I may be wrong. I it went in doubt, quote C.S. Lewis, right? Yeah, right? He said something like being functional atheists. Mm. And I think a lot of times in the church, we're raising these functional atheists. They have good jobs, good careers, good college educations, but they don't love Jesus. And what you're saying is that's the wrong target. Yeah, and the thing that hit me when you said that is... Uh, and we say it over and over in the book. If it if it isn't in you as a parent, it's gonna be hard for them to catch. You know, it's so easy to say, "Hey, kids, you should do this, do that." But if they're not seeing mom or dad or mom and dad with a fire for Jesus. You know, where it's just caught, it's not gonna travel very far. You can make all the rules you want. You can get them in every youth group in the church and do all the right stuff. And we all know the numbers say all the kids in the youth group not all of them, but a lot of them don't walk with Jesus after college. And I think a lot of it, and, and by the way, the research also says the kids that were in the great youth groups that came home to homes where mom and dad were living what they were hearing at church, their percentages go a lot higher that they become men and women, moms and dads who are living for Jesus. Again, it's not all on us, but man, it is. I, I, I mentioned one time in the book, that I was asked to speak to a, a men's retreat just at dinner. It was some guys I knew and long story short, they just said, we're going to do a retreat. You don't need to come, but could you spend dinner and we could ask you questions about being a dad? And I said, yeah. And then they said, Hey, Cody just preached at church. He's on fire and he's in college. Is there any way Cody could come with you? And he was home after a bowl game. And so I said, Cody, you want to go? So we go. Long story short, they ask all these questions. And finally, one of them turns to Cody and says, hey, Cody, we just heard you preach. You're on fire right now for Jesus. And we're all hoping that when our kids are in college, they're on fire like that. What did your dad do to help you be where you are spiritually? And I remember sitting beside him. He's just right beside me. And I remember my first thought was, man, there are so many things I did. I mean, we did mission trips. I did Bible <laughs> studies. I did devos with him, you know, all these different things. And I just thought, I wonder what, which one of those are, you know, and I look over and he's just sitting there and it, it was a long, you know, pause. It was so long. I was like getting like, what in the world? And so finally he just looks at these guys and he goes, you know, he did one thing. And they're like, yeah, what? And I was thinking, what one thing, you know? And he said, he lived it. He goes, if oh. I wanted to know what a man of God looked like, he was right down the hall. He And he actually added this. He had no idea what was going on in my mind, but he goes, you know, I don't remember a single Bible study. <laughs> I don't remember any of those <laughs> great sermons he gave that he thought were so good, but I knew this. That's what a man of God looks like. Now, obviously, I didn't live it perfectly, but it hit me right there. It's like, wow, our model is so much more important than anything we say. And so if we're hoping that's going to happen, if they hit, if we hit the bullseye, you know, down range, it's really going to be, are we living what we're hoping yeah. they will be living? That, that is just so powerful. You know, I was a youth pastor for two decades wow. and I was always intrigued at how church kids turned out poorly oftentimes, but these kids that got saved in our program from non-Christian families that were dysfunctional sometimes did so well because their only model was the youth staff. Yeah. And so that was really interesting. But you met, you quoted in your book, I don't, I think it's Josh McDowell, but you said something I want to bring out. I think it's important, especially in light of the story with you and Cody. You said in the book, you said rules without relationship equal rebellion. And this is what we're talking about. We're saying, hey, I've got a relationship with Jesus. Hmm. I've got a relationship with you. It's more than just the rule, but the rule is just a medium to something bigger and deeper. So I really do appreciate that. I think that's so important. Rule number four was, uh, and I think this is, this is, it's when I read this in your book, I thought I could have wrote this. This is exactly what I believe. This is, ex I have this on my bumper sticker on my car. I get weird looks. I get people arguing with me. And you said, I neglected my marriage on my bumper sticker in my car is a bumper sticker we made. And it says, wife is greater than kids. Mm. And you'd be shocked at how controversial that is. I got interrupted in a wedding by my brother who disagreed with that statement at a wow. wedding I was performing. And so can you talk about this, this prioritizing your marriage over the children and not neglecting your marriage? 
Yeah, I, I do think we live in a child-centered culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. In, in some ways, that's good. That's a good thing. But I think we can easily value our kids over our marriage. And I know it's easy for us as husbands and wives to do. And I think sometimes, I think Ann would tell you, she was so disappointed many times in our relationship, in the marriage, that she put her energy into the boys because they were better to her than I was. Um, you know, our first book, Vertical Marriage, is about our 10-year anniversary when she said to me, I've lost my feelings for you. And that was when we had two little babies basically in the house and she was pregnant with our third. And I had no idea that we were in trouble. I would have told mm. you our marriage is great. And I realized that night, wow, we are close to separating. And it was at that moment I said, okay, I got to bring all my heart and all my energy to make this marriage what God wants it to be and what I want it to be. And that's a whole nother story. But I still think even as God really did a miracle to rebuild and restore our marriage. I think it was very easy to drift even away. And we talked about it earlier. I got real involved in ministry, the church, you name it, even doing things with the boys. And I often neglected the marriage. And in some ways, I think I might've overstated that mistake. Cause if you ask my three boys, even now as adult, men about their mom and dad's marriage, they would have said, man, the one thing you guys modeled for us is you made your marriage a priority. So that in some sense, I think we did a pretty good job. I mean, we, we dated weekly. Um, we took a, we went away by ourselves every year for a marriage retreat. Often we were speaking at those, but then there were others that we said, no, we don't need to speak. We just need to go away and rest without the kids. And let me tell you, you, you know, this, I know very few marriages that ever vacation without the kids. They won't even do that. Yeah. They're like, I'm not leaving my kids, whether they're five years old or 15, you need to, you need to take a vacation without the kids and pour energy into your marriage. Cause one of the best gifts you're ever going to give your children is a great marriage. And I tell you what, I have three sons now married. They all date weekly. They all pour energy into their, their marriages. And I know why they watch mom and dad do it. Well, you said in your book on page 200, you said a great marriage brings security to the home yep. and makes our kids feel safe. Yep. And the unfortunate thing is we live in this helicopter mom and bulldozer dad world where everybody gets a participation trophy yeah. and the kids are the center of the world and it's just demonic. Now, I got to tell you this. I grew up telling my kids I'm a hunter. And so I would tell my kids, man, I love you. I, I love you. But if it comes to taking a bullet, as hard as it would be for me, you're going to be gone. I'm going to take a bullet for mom first. Mm. And so I grew up telling them that hard talk, like mom is the most important person. Yeah. And if this is a problem, and then I'll say this to the guys. So what you went, I, I want to get you back on and talk about vertical marriage, because what you experienced at 10 years, we experienced at 20 years. We went wow. into a counseling appointment and uh, man, our marriage was a, I didn't realize how bad it had gotten. Of course, my head's in a stand. Yeah. And so my wife and I decided that every 10 years we're going to get counseling. Mm. So we got counseling at the 20 year mark. Now we're at the 30 year mark. We're in counseling right now just because yeah. we just are doing it because we think it's good. And so uh, guys, you got to keep those marriages strong, man. Uh, last one, we're running down about eight or 10 minutes left, Dave. Uh, and I, I thought this was really good. And, and again, uh, I think that I could have written this chapter, this section, because I've experienced the same thing because I have, maybe it's a boys versus daughters thing. I don't know, but mistake number five, was I didn't hug enough. And, but you, but you did, that's not really true. Cause you did hug a lot when they were little. Can you talk about as you've went through these dis four discipline stages of uh, training, coaching, uh, no training. What was it? Discipline, training, coaching, and friendship, how you're hugging kind of changed through those phases. Yeah. We must be uh, bald brothers or something, you know, <laughs> keep relating you, to my mistakes. I'm <laughs> yeah. serious. I mean, you know, when I was writing those mistakes, and of course there could have been 15, you know, I only put five in the book. Um, I did not think this was going to be one that would come to my mind. And yet I, I put it in there because I thought, you know, if I could do it all over again, that I would do differently. Um, like you said, I hugged them when they were little boys. You know, I'd be in bed with them almost every night, you know, reading Bible, praying with them. They're three, they're four, they're five. We're wrestling. They're, they're jumping on top of me. You know, we had a trampoline. They're crushing me. 
um, you know, even seven, eight years old, but something happened. And I don't know if I knew it at the moment, but as they became 12, 13, 14, it felt weird to me. It shouldn't have, but you know, my beard is rubbing against their beard and it was almost like too intimate, you know? And that's, again, that's part of my brokenness, but I, I found myself pulling back a little bit. And at the same time, you know, they're becoming men and they're like, you know, dad, you don't need to hug me. And they even, I mean, I remember one time uh, Ann got in bed with one of our boys when he was 13 and every, every night he's like, mom, get in bed with me. And then one night she crawls in there and he looks at her and he goes, what are you doing? She goes, I'm crawling in bed with you to pray with you. He goes, get out of my bed. I'm 13 years old, mom. I don't want you in my bed anymore. And she just said, she sort of crawled out of the room like, oh no. I sort of did the same thing. Cause again, we said it in that, that the, the teenage stage, they're pulling away and they should. And so, but all I know is, you know, even at my church, it was true. We had another pastor, Steve, who's a hugger. Anybody walks up to him, he hugs him. They used to say, Steve's the hugger, Dave's not the hugger. And I, and I sort of wore that as a badge for a while. Like, yeah, I'm the manly man and Steve's the soft guy. And you know what? I realized people like Steve a lot more than they like Dave. <laughs> and your kids are going to like it too. So again, I'm not great at it now, but I want to become the man. And again, not in an inappropriate way, but is that is affectionate. That's a, that's a good thing. Men want their father to hug them and to show affection. When you see them, when you say goodbye to them, when something great happens in their life or even it, you name it, just get over the fear thing and say, man, embrace your son as a father. That's something they long for. And I, you know what? I grew up my whole life longing for that from my dad and never got it. And I don't want to, I don't yeah. want to continue that legacy. I want to change that legacy. Well, the funny part in this is I did the same thing you did. And then on page 201, you say something really cool. I want to read it. You said, hug your kids at any age and every age. It doesn't matter whether or not you're an affectionate person. So mm. funny story. So I have two, one hugger and two that aren't. And, and as I've, as my kids have become adults, they're now training me. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, it's funny because I've told my kids, I love them. I still do. I love them till they're boring. It's boring. I say, I love them all the time. Well, my dad, who never said it to me, when he calls my kids, they always say, love you, grandpa. Hmm. And he would always mumble. Rah, 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 rah. <laughs> well, now they've trained him to say, I love you back. Wow. And so now my dad is saying, I love you to me wow. because my kids have trained him. So it's funny how the whole thing comes full circle. And so I just think that was such a powerful statement because our kids, no matter what the age is, they want us to look at them. But, you know, we had a Dan Mears on our podcast. No, it wasn't Dan Mears. It was Tom Wilson, I think. He's got the ministry called, what's it called, Dale? I can't remember, but, oh, the family dad, the family dad, family guy. And he says, smile at your kids. Mm. And I thought, man, what? Because, I, you know, smile at your kids and hug your kids. And so I think that was just such a powerful point to end on, uh, Dave. I really appreciate it. And so, Dave, I think this is a great book. Guys, listen, if you're intimidated to read, this is an easy book to read. It's super fun, full of stories. I think you're really going to like it. So, guy, how can they get pick up your books and your resources, Dave? Well, I can get the books anywhere you get books, Amazon or wherever. Um, but if you want to reach out to us, you can find us on Instagram or Twitter, or Facebook, Dave and Wilson. And direct message us if we can help you in any way. Man, oh man, we want to help you. And I got to tell you, Jim, I don't think I've ever done a podcast with a, with a host who read every single page of our book. Way to go. Wow. Or even yeah. read it. Most people listen to it, but you read it. So I'm impressed. Well, I got to write it down and so I can quote it some days, you know, I've got everything quoted and highlighted and, and, uh, no, I, I, so here's my thing, man, I've written, I'm almost done with my 12th book and wow. you pour your heart and soul into these books. Yeah. And for me to have a guy not read the book is insulting. Hmm. And so I want to honor you, Dave. Uh, you've had a, you've got a great ministry. You're impacting hundreds of thousands of people. And, uh, to read the book, uh, says to me, says to you, for me, I respect you and I honor you. And I hope that you got that today. That's good. That is great. I appreciate that. And I, and I would add, if you've never listened to Family Life Today, uh, it's a podcast or a radio broadcast. We try to do it, what you're doing right now, Jim. We try to help men especially 
understand what a godly man, husband, dad looks like in marriage and family. And so that's a great resource for, uh, especially for men uh, to listen to, to challenge them to become the man God wants them to be. Oh, that's so good. Well, I will send you my latest book. It's an Amazon number one bestseller. It's called The Strong Men, Strong Men, Dangerous Times. So guys, here's your action item for today. Let's get our boots on the ground. Let's put some, some traction to what we heard. And, and here it is, guys. This is really simple. I want you to go listen to their radio show, Family Life Today. That is outstanding. It is one of the best in the world. I think you're going to be really blessed. These guys are open, honest, and vulnerable, and it'll make you a better man and the best version of a dad and husband that you can be. So thanks a lot, Dave, for coming on our show. Sure appreciate it, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. And Dale, drive us home, brother. Yeah, guys, we want you to go on over to meninthearena.org and join our program. Just click on the link on the front page, and teams are filling up, so you might want to get on that right away. And if you're not able to get on that list, you might have to wait until winter. Until next time, fill the wet sand on the arena floor. Hear the deafening roar of the crowd. Taste the sweetness of victory. Smell the stench of battle. Get in the game. Get dirty. Grind it out. And be a man. You've been listening to the Men in the Arena podcast. If you hunger to be your best version, then join thousands of men from around the world in our Men in the Arena forum on Facebook. This is the best place to have open discussions around the topic of biblical manhood. Make sure to explore our website at meninthearena.org, sign up for the weekly equipping blast, and take advantage of our many free resources designed to help you become your best version of a man. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Men in the Arena podcast. Remember, when a man gets it, Everyone wins.